Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. I know people are still trickling in, but we want to welcome you to the latest installment of our Parent Like a Pro series. Uh, we so appreciate you joining. Feel free as you come on in to drop we, where you are dialing in from. I love seeing where people are located. It's usually from far reaches of the country, which I love seeing. So let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. I <laughs> will kick it off with introductions. Um, again, I I'm um, really grateful for everyone who's joined the last couple of installments to our Parent Like a Pro series. We've had some amazing conversations over the last week about parenting principles and sleep. And tonight I am joined by two amazing women who are going to be, you know, really uh, leading the conversation around fertility. Um, it's definitely a topic that is personal to me. I should introduce myself. I'm Quinn. I oversee brand at Nanit. Um, and I'm also an ex-patient of Dr. Lucky C. Khan, um, and I've, I just have her, to, I just have to thank her, and I'm so grateful to her for the family that I have. I don't know if I would have my daughter without her help. You are in the best of company tonight. Um, she's an amazing expert. If you don't follow her on social, she has amazing content um, about this topic as well. Um, I know people who have reached out to me over the last week as we've been promoting this event being like, I didn't know, you know, we were working with her and, you know, I think uh, if you are looking for a resource, um, Lucky's uh, Instagram and, and social channels are amazing. And Ashley as well, um, she's a friend of the brand, an amazing creator, and also an ex-patient of Lucky's. So we have um, that in common, but I'll leave it to you. I'll pass it to you guys to, for quick introductions and your background, um, and then we'll get started. You want to go first, Ashley? <laughs> Um, I don't know how much of a professional I am here, but I have a lot of experience with infertility, uh, miscarriages, and I also had a stillbirth. Um, like Quinn said, I am a patient of Dr. Lucky Seacon. Um, I mean, she'll continue to be my doctor because hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I'm going to have another child. We'll see. Um, but I... I try to, you know, inform people about politics and things that will affect them within their communities and how they can make a difference. Um, that's just a little bit about me. You can go, Lucky. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Lucky Seacon. I'm based at RMA of New York. Uh, we're a large fertility clinic in New York City. Um, people get confused because there's a lot of RMAs, but this is just in New York. But we have labs in Westchester, Brooklyn, Long Island, and in Manhattan, where I'm based. And um, I really love my job. I'm a fertility specialist. I help people preserve their fertility for the future. I help people understand their fertility and strategize and plan things out. And then I help people that are struggling with infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. So we really do it all. We help a lot of same-sex couples with family building because they will often need the help of science and donor eggs or donor sperm. And there's just so many different things that we do in a given day here. Um, but the most important underlying common thread is that it's a really personal, special relationship that we have with our patients. I really um, enjoy what I do outside of my day job on social media because as a woman who's gone through for her own fertility journey and as someone who helps many other people going through it, I know firsthand that even in 2024, information is shockingly inaccessible and people are always searching for more. And sometimes it's good information and a lot of times it's bad information. So I'm trying to be the voice of reason and bring good information to light and also remove the stigma and make people feel less alone because you're not alone. One in six people deal with infertility. So I think we're gonna talk about all of that and more today. I'm really excited to be here. Yes, we are. Um, just one quick housekeeping thing before we get started. Um, feel free to uh, you know, follow along. And at the end of this chat, one lucky winner will receive um, our brand new Sound and Light product. It's an amazing three-in-one um, brand new uh, product that we just launched last year. Um, it's 3-1 because it's not only just a nightlight, a, a sound machine, it's also an audio monitor and now the smartest audio monitor on the market. So feel free to follow along and one lucky winner at the end will be awarded. Um, okay, let's get going. So 
I wanted to start with just going back to the basics. There's obviously um, a lot of different, uh, you know, people in the chat room and in and, and the Zoom room and various, um, you know, knowledge and experience of this topic. So <clears throat> one of the things that really, uh, <laughs> that I remember just walking into your office for the very first time, because I literally knew zero, zero, zero about this topic. And you helped me so much um, from that very first meeting of just breaking it all the way down by drawing me a picture. <laughs> do you remember yeah. that? Um, yes. I wondered if we could take it all the way back to just what do people need to know? What are some of the misconceptions? Um, how do you talk your patients through, you know, at the at, even at that very first meeting? Yeah, I think I always just start with basics because the only time most of us have talked about this or focused on it in our lives was high school health class. And the focus was very different, obviously, back then. It was all about how not to have an unplanned pregnancy. And I think, you know, the reality of it is that it's a lot harder than you think to get pregnant. And it's not unique to any individual listening to this. It's really a human problem. Human reproduction is inefficient. And the reality needs to be laid out for everyone to level set expectations. Because a lot of times people come into my office and they're so upset that they've been trying for three months and it hasn't happened. And they think something's really wrong with them. And I explain that it usually, even in best case scenario, if you're in your 20s and you have what we think, you know, is the best possible egg quality, even then it's like a 20 to 25% chance each month if you're someone who even ovulates every month, right? So there's a lot that has to line up perfectly. And when I explain that there's really only two to three day window each month where it could make sense and be high yield to try, because when you ovulate, you're only releasing one egg per month, if you're someone who gets a period every month, and that lasts for half a day to a day. And if it's not fertilized in that time frame, it basically just kind of disintegrates, goes away, and you have to wait a whole month for your next window of opportunity. Sperm can survive in the reproductive tract for three to five days. So that's why people are, are always trying to time their attempt. And it's really smart to do that. But a lot of people don't know about that, which is shocking, yeah. right? Yep. And so it's important to not waste time because fertility is a time sensitive thing. In the background, we have to be aware of the fact that we're born with all the eggs that we're ever going to have. We don't make new eggs and we don't fix or repair our eggs. So it's important to make every attempt count. But even if you time everything perfectly, there's no guarantee that the egg and the sperm are going to get together. Even when we try to force that to happen in an IVF lab, we know it's like 80% of eggs at best will fertilize and only like 60% are capable of turning into embryos, which takes a whole week. Mm -hmm. And then when we go to test the embryos, which is something we can do as part of IVF, we know that no one makes perfect embryos. Even in your 20s, 20% 20 of embryos are going to be abnormal. And as we approach you know, our 40s, it's more like 60, 70%. So it can just take many more ovulations to have that random lucky egg, no pun intended, get ovulated that has the capability of turning into a healthy pregnancy. So the whole thing is inefficient. As we get older, it becomes less efficient and there are higher risks of things like miscarriage. And so there are things you can do to get ahead of it. Not everyone has to freeze their eggs, but everyone should know about that option if they're going to be in a position where they're not ready to start building their family and they envision themselves maybe being ready past age 35. These are all things that become more accentuated at that age, right? So um, there's so much to pack into this short hour. And obviously I don't want to belabor it, but these are the types of conversations I have day in, day out. And you'd be so surprised to know how little the average person knows about their fertility and how their bodies work. And so it's really important to have that conversation before we can even talk about here are the tests or here are the potential treatments. Ashley, what was your experience like in terms of your expectations or your um, you know, base knowledge before seeing Lucky or during, you know, as you were seeing Lucky? Well, so even before I saw Lucky, um, I got pregnant pretty quickly once I removed my IUD. And so I was like, oh, this is, this is going to be easy. This will, this is, you know, I thought it was going to be harder. And once I had a miscarriage and then I had a failed, um, IUI, and then I had to stop my next IUI cycle because the pandemic happened. Um, so all the, all the procedures were canceled. Um, and then I got pregnant unassisted with my son, CJ. Um, and when he died, Lucky actually contacted me and she was just like, you know, when you're ready, 
why don't we have a talk about what the next steps are? And I'm so thankful to her for that because I kind of thought, oh, you know, I got pregnant on my own. I maybe I won't have trouble the next time. Um, so once I met with her and she explained everything to me and kind of the way I viewed it in my head was this is something I can do while I'm giving my body time to rest, right? This is a way I can feel like I'm doing something because I gave birth. Like I have to let my body rest before I try again. Um, so doing IVF during that time was one, the smartest thing I did. Um, I would not have my daughter now if I didn't do that because right when I did um, the IVF process, I actually got pregnant again, unassisted, but I had a miscarriage again. So without Lucky's help, without her sitting me down and being real about just how difficult it was going to be for me to not only get pregnant and keep the baby um, unassisted, <laughs> uh, you know, it was just... It was a needed process for me. Um, at that point, my my eggs were just old and it wasn't going to be likely for me to get pregnant without IVF and keep the baby. It's really interesting how you describe that process being one that can be done while allowing your body to rest. Because I think a lot of the conversation about IVF is how taxing it is. Um, and I, lucky, I'd love to understand your perspective on what you hear from patient patients in terms of their concerns about that and, you know, how they can, um, manage those concerns, you know, or anxieties as they're going through the process, both, um, physically as well as from a mental health standpoint. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll open by saying that in Ashley's situation, it just seemed like a very logical thing. A lot of people are confused about how soon after a miscarriage um, or a loss can they go through an egg retrieval cycle. And the answer is, is once your levels are back to normal, right? And, and, and really you should talk to your doctor about the exact recommendation, but the amount of time that we would recommend resting after something like she experienced and getting pregnant again is very different than the amount of time we'd recommend needs to happen or, or an amount of time of healing that's required before doing an egg retrieval. An egg retrieval is just taking medications for eight to 10 days, stimulating the ovaries, trying to get as many of the eggs that are available to grow and mature before and, and extracting them before your body would throw them away, right? Along with that one egg that you ovulate, disintegrating if it doesn't get fertilized in that cycle, all these other eggs that got randomly recruited and pulled to the surface of the ovaries, they're also kind of going away. So there's always this process of a random subset of eggs being pulled to the ovaries and being recruited and then one being ovulated and then all of them going away. A lot of people don't realize that and they worry that if they're doing IVF, we're depleting their eggs and they're going to go into menopause faster. And I always say, I wish I knew how to access more eggs and summon more to the surface, but I'm limited to working with what your body makes available. And so after a loss, you know, it, it doesn't take that long to start ovulating again or being able to respond to those signals and the levels can kind of go back down to negative in terms of the, the pregnancy hormone. And, and that's a window of opportunity. And yes, going through IVF, I'm not saying it's a walk through the park, but I think there's different levels, right? I think when you've been through something like that, resting really is not getting pregnant and allowing your body to normalize, it's also a mental health issue, right? You really need to kind of work through that loss and process everything and be in a mental head stays, headspace where you can actually go through this again. Because every pregnancy thereafter has a bit of PTSD with it, right? Or a lot of PTSD with it because, and, and anyone who's gone through any level of loss will, will tell you that. So I think it gave her a little bit of space and time but not to the detriment of her fertility, right? So a lot of my patients will have these types of scenarios where we'll do the egg retrieval and freeze eggs or create embryos and freeze them. And then it gives them time to just breathe and do things on the schedule that makes sense for their mental health and when they're actually ready physically and mentally to move forward. The actual process of IVF, you know, I've been through it and I would say 
it's very different for different people, but the vast majority of patients will not say that it was so taxing that they would never do it again, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's going to be the most fun thing that you've ever done. There's definitely lots of bloating and there's fluid retention because your estrogen levels get high and your, your ovaries get bigger than what they would normally be. So you definitely don't feel like yourself, but it's very transient. It's eight to 10 days. Yep. And so you're maybe feeling that for about a week, maybe two weeks, you know, there's some resolution of symptoms after the egg retrieval, but all in, it goes by pretty fast in the moment you could complain about it. But after the fact, it's like kind of a distant memory. Um, so I feel like, you know, for most people it's worth it. Are there risks associated with it? Sure, but they're very, very low, a very low chance of things like bleeding after retrieval, infection. And there's a lot of precautions that are, are given like a course of antibiotics after the retrieval. So it's a very low risk, short-lived procedure is what I'll say about it. Yeah, that was my experience as well. I was I was surprised at how manageable the timeframes were, you know, yeah. on, on both ends. Um, and so, in, and also weirdly enough, I felt like it was preparing me for parenthood because of the scheduling and having to be, you know, just on top of it all. Um, and so it, it, it really marked a shift in the way that I was conducting myself and sort of what I was prioritizing. Yeah. As well. So it was kind of like the beginning of, of my new life <laughs> really. Um, all right. So you talked about, um, let's talk about secondary infertility. Um, because I know that many of our a customer base, you know, may already have children, but maybe trying for their second or, you know, another child. Um, how common is that? You know, what would you, is there anything that you would recommend doing differently, you know, for a second or third versus the first pregnancy? Um, you know, what, what are you seeing out there? Yeah. So going back to Ashley's case, um, not to keep using you as an example, but <laughs> another thing that you and I had talked about was thinking about not just baby number one, baby number two, baby number three, like thinking big picture, right. And, and really, um, putting yourself in the scenario of, okay, well, yes, we could revert to medicated IUI, which is just kind of giving you an extra push, making things a little bit less inefficient, but it's not a very high tech option. And it's more about the here and now, right? It's just making things more likely to happen inside of your body. And then you're going to be pregnant for a certain amount of time, deliver, maybe you're breastfeeding, maybe you're not. There's like this whole window where you're kind of out of the game. You can't do an egg retrieval. Maybe it's not obvious, but you can't do an egg retrieval while someone's pregnant and while they're breastfeeding, generally speaking, you can't. So you kind of are locked out from doing the procedure again. And so when you're thinking about the big picture, if you're someone who's especially approaching your mid thirties, or you could be in a situation where you'll be having even baby number two or three in your mid to late thirties or forties and beyond, as we get older, there's a higher chance of our eggs turning into embryos that have missing or extra DNA. And this is the number one reason why an embryo won't implant or might implant and then stop growing. That's in other words, a miscarriage. It's the number one cause of that. So we know that the, the rate of that issue of these genetic imbalances increases, you know, from a third of embryos being abnormal at 35 to about 50% at 38 and more like 70, 60 to 70% at 40. So those numbers sound scary, but I always like to think like an optimist that tells you that there are still many eggs that turn into normal embryos, which is why people do get pregnant unassisted without my help at 38, at 40, even at 42. But mm -hmm. the odds of ovulating that healthy egg and all those things lining up are just lower. And so the odds of needing help are higher. And so if you think you're going to be in that zone of your life eventually and still be trying to have kids at some point, whether it's for baby number one or two, it makes sense to think about freezing eggs or freezing embryos. If you freeze embryos, you know, it means you're willing to commit to the sperm. And the downside of that is inflexibility. You can't unfertilize them. But the upside is, is that you can know how many of those eggs actually were able to turn into embryos in real time and test them and know what you have. And embryos survive the thaw really well. 90% of eggs survive the thaw. And then you have to get through all these other steps, whereas 98% of embryos survive the thaw and you know what you have. So there's just important nuance there. But I guess my point is, you know, as, as a woman, I went through this at 34 as a preventative measure, because obviously I know too much, right? And I didn't have trouble with my first, luckily. But 
inevitably it was harder for me to get pregnant over the age of 38. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to call it. It's been several months and I'm done struggling and I'm just going to use an embryo that I froze preemptively. Mm -hmm. And it made my journey that much easier. So um, I think secondary infertility is preventable um, nowadays with the advent of egg freezing and embryo freezing. I think um, that's not to say if you face it, like you should have done this, you should have done that. I'm not blaming, but it is good to know that there's things we can do to be proactive. Um, but it's a really common problem. And I think it's a lonely problem because there is this um, idea of like, well, at least you have one, or at least you have, at least you have, you know, people don't have the same level of empathy and don't provide as much support for secondary infertility. It's kind of like, yeah, I mean, you know, your, your, your pain and your suffering is lesser than, and I see it all the time in my patients. I think it's very painful to not feel fully embraced by the trying to conceive infertility community, because you feel yeah. guilty that you have at least whatever you have. And right. there's some, some people that don't. And so that's something that I think people don't talk enough about. And that's a nice um, sort of segue into what can you say when someone has exper is experiencing, um, you know, difficulty in their journey or, you know, Ashley, from your perspective loss, is there anything that is helpful to say? What are, you know, there's so much that's shared on social about what not to say um, and what is inappropriate. And so can we offer this community, you know, some pointers on what would be supportive and helpful? The number one thing I tell anyone whenever someone in their family or someone they know is going through IVF first is to try and learn about the process yourself. Read online about it as much as you can, because the last thing I wanted to do was repeat what I was going through and define everything for everyone a million times in all my conversations. So if just one time someone would have known like what an embryo transfer was, like I would have been overjoyed. And it's not to say that like, I didn't want to talk to people about it because I did, but I just wish someone would have made that effort to understand what I was going through. Mm -hmm. um, besides like talking to someone else who's been through it before. And I think that's just, that's one way you can really go out of your way for friends or family that are going through it. That really shows that you care and that you love them. <laughs> Were you um, open about your journey as you were in your journey, as you were experiencing things or what's your take on, you know, sharing at which points and, you know, there's so much that I feel like people are keeping quiet about, you know, just because they say, don't announce your pregnancy until X number of weeks, um, but then no one knows you're pregnant. So then no one knows you've lost it. Right. So what was your experience and how did you handle your journey? I tried to be as open and honest as possible because I really feel like at that time, a lot of people weren't talking about it. Um, I felt like my loss was very shocking and people didn't know how to respond to that. So I've tried to do a lot of education around like what you shouldn't say to someone who's experiencing infertility or um, a loss like that. One common thing that people would say is they would suggest adoption and surrogacy, which, listen, those are two wonderful things, but they are not answers to infertility or, you know, something going wrong in the IVF process. Um, and I, I know that people don't mean it maliciously. It's just that that's a very complicated process as well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think people realize like how much goes into it, how expensive it is too. Um, it's, it's not a simple answer. Um, I, I don't ever want to push people to be more open and honest about what they're going through. But I will say that when you do talk about it, you find other people that you can relate to. And that really helps because it is a very lonely process unless you're joining some sort of like online community. Right, and right. sometimes it feels nice to have someone in person that you can talk to. Yeah. And I will say that the few people in my life who did know that I was going through IVF would check in on me. And in those critical moments along the way, you know, drop me a line of well wishes. And that really did a lot for me, you know, and um, 
I, that's the one advice that I've given other people in my life who I know are going through IVF. It's like, you know, your comfort level for sure, but just think about it. You don't have to, this doesn't have to be a secret within, you know, that you keep from, from ones that you love. Um, the people you love want to support you and, you know, just think about sharing as much as you want to, because those, you know, words of, you know, words of encouragement really, really, really go a long way when you're, you're feeling stressed and anxious and, you know, um, needing that extra, extra bit of support. I also feel like people worry sometimes that if they come out and say, I'm going through this, that they're going to keep being nudged for updates. And so a lot of times they just like, will be completely, you know, silent and not share. Um, I think it's okay to give people direction. Sometimes people don't know how to act and what to do. And I think saying like, I could use your support and it would be great to hear from you. Um, but know that I'm not always going to answer and, you know, want to give updates throughout. Like, I think it's not our job to tell people how to act, but sometimes we can make our lives easier by giving people guidance. Right. So sometimes yep. I like to get ahead of things. Um, let, let's go into, um, treatment options. Cause we've mentioned IUI a couple of times, um, can you explain the difference between IUI and IVF and what, how, how would one decide between the two at various points in the experience? Yeah. yeah. So I kind of ran through what it takes to get pregnant, right. And how inefficient it is. And so if you find yourself in a position where you've been trying for a year, you're under 35, you've been trying for at least a year, and this is not a rule, but this is the general guideline you shouldn't wait longer than a year. Like you need to go in and get some testing done to figure out if there's any barriers, obvious barriers to all of these things lining up. And maybe, you know, at that point it's time for treatment. If you're over the age of 35, don't wait longer than six months is the guidance. And if you're in your forties, don't wait longer than three months to see a specialist. The testing is going to look at things like obvious barriers, right? Are there blocked tubes that we need to work around? Well, if so, you know, when we do an x-ray, and we image the uterine cavity and the tubes, if there's a blockage, we need to bypass that. So that is straight to IVF, right? So the testing will help triage which path you should take to try to overcome this infertility or inefficiency. And um, if the testing all comes back normal, you know, the sperm, if the sperm concentration is low, again, the answer for that or the workaround is IVF. But if everything, let's say, comes back normal, then you really have two major options. There's two buckets of treatment. And of course, I'm oversimplifying things, but I think sometimes people work it up in their head. I know I did before I got into this field and before I became an OBGYN, I assumed there were a hundred different treatment options. And now I realize it's really two different buckets. It's medication to help you potentially ovulate more regularly or ovulate a few extra eggs because one egg feels like such a long shot for everyone in combination with something called an insemination, which is taking a sample of sperm, whether it's from a donor or from a partner, washing it, concentrating it and injecting a very high, highly motile, healthy fraction of sperm just at the top of the uterus. A lot of people think we're like aiming for the egg. We're just dropping it off at the top of the uterus and that way it has less distance to travel and there's just more of an overlap between potential multiple eggs and multiple sperm. It's almost like a form of gambling. You're just trying to increase the odds on both sides because you don't really know what's going on and you just want to increase the chance of an interaction being successful. And that's why it's not that successful, right? Uh, if it works for you, it's 100% success and that's great. But in general, we have to be realistic that this is one of those strategies where it doesn't make sense if the first one doesn't work to all of a sudden say, oh my gosh, something is majorly wrong. We don't expect the first one to work. Go into it mentally prepared that this may be something that you try for two, three, maybe four rounds. Mm -hmm. That's when it's worth doing it if you're willing to do that, because it's really only increasing your chances by a few percentage points. If your baseline chance is about 15% each ovulated egg, Maybe this is increasing at most to 20, but usually it's like in the teens or single digits. So if it can give you the extra push that gets you there, great. So if you're, you know, in your early thirties or in your twenties and you want to have multiple kids, you may still have a bit of a runway where you could achieve that as long as you don't wait too long between attempts. Or if you are 
33 and you really just want to have one. That's it. That's your goal. Maybe it's worth trying that for three or four rounds, right? And, and then reevaluate with your doctor. If that hasn't worked after six, there's studies that show there's diminishing returns on that seventh or eighth to try. And it's been now half a year. It's like we have to kind of be cognizant at all times that fertility is time sensitive when it comes to egg quantity and quality. And the other treatment option that we'll often move to or sometimes go straight to depending on the person and their, their situation is IVF. IVF is very different. Unlike medication with insemination, which is lower tech, but also more laid back, less of a burden, less shots, less work, right? In a given cycle. It's more fatiguing in other ways because it's hard to keep doing the same thing over and over and not losing enth enthusiasm between each cycle. Um, so it does wear on people in my observation, but IVF is more work. You're taking shots, eight to 10 days of injections, usually twice a day. The shots are not so hard, but by the end, you're just like annoyed by them, right? And you're coming in a lot more for insemination cycles. There's very little monitoring compared to the every other day type visits that you're coming in early morning for blood work, ultrasound every time. And then it culminates with an actual procedure that's done under sedation or anesthesia. It's a very simple, easy procedure that's low risk, but you're put to sleep. And that's the one day you take off of work. You're not put to sleep for inseminations, right? And then we're taking the eggs out the way we do it. It's all done vaginally. There's no incisions on your abdomen. This is not a major surgery. But it's a procedure and you're definitely going to have cramping and, and you know, uh, a recovery day. And then there's the waiting game. And we know not every egg will fertilize and not every egg, but you're going to have multiple eggs. So the idea is hopefully you have multiple so that despite all the drop off that normally happens in your body, you're still going to hopefully end up with multiple embryos. And then we can test those embryos. We can freeze them. And the nice thing is, is that we can test those embryos and select the best one to transfer and each one if it's normal and has the right amount of DNA, we'll have about a 60 to 70% chance of live birth. So if you can make the embryo for most people within one, two, at most three transfers, most people do get pregnant. So it works really well. It's not a guarantee. IVF is not a guarantee because not everyone can make a normal embryo and some people have implantation issues. But for the most part, it's much more successful than IUI. And you can freeze the extra embryos. So that takes care of hopefully, you know, preventing secondary infertility. And by testing the embryos, you're reducing the risk of a miscarriage from chromosomal errors or imbalances. And, um, you know, you can put back one embryo at a time. So unlike the medication with insemination, which is a bit of a gamble, you might re release two or three eggs and two could implant, right? There's a three to 8% risk of twins which are high risk pregnancies. That's not the goal. Nowadays with IVF, people think that it's more aggressive. So you're going to have higher rates of twins, but it's the opposite. We're only putting back one embryo at a time. So very rare for that embryo to split and turn into twins. So those are the high level differences. They're very different treatment options and doing one or starting with one doesn't you know, negate moving on to the other. And sometimes people that have a hard time with IVF because they have a low egg count, I will revert back to IUIs because the success of that is less dependent on having enough eggs to work with. So it can really go in either direction. Awesome. Um, once you have embryos, um, how, you know, if you're in your late thirties, early forties, how much long, you know, how old can you be, right? What, what is there an age limit to um, being able to get pregnant if you already have embryos? So I'm going to tell you guys an uplifting fact that I love to shout from the rooftops and I want to put it on a t-shirt that I wear every day. <laughs> the uterus doesn't age. So, and also the amount of time that the embryos are frozen have no bearing on the reproductive potential. They don't get freezer burned, so to speak, right? They're just suspended in time. So. I have had patients come back at 45, 46 and easily get pregnant because they had these frozen embryos from when they did IVF at 38, 39, which is incredible. Now, is it completely benign to just, you know, everyone wait till their late forties or their fifties and carry pregnancies? No, of course not. As we get older, our vascular um, system changes, you know, you're more at risk of things like high blood pressure, just in general, the wear and tear of aging can predispose you to more complications in pregnancy. But it's not a question of, can you get pregnant and can you stay pregnant? That's taken care of, which is pretty incredible. Even if you went into menopause, even if someone surgically removed your ovaries, God forbid, 
I could give you the hormones to support the early pregnancy implanting. And then eventually the placenta would start churning out those hormones. So yeah, you can get pregnant in menopause if you have frozen embryos or eggs. Wow. That's incredible. And good news for me because <laughs> I'm not in a rush. Um, okay. Let's turn to, you know, a, a more, a topic that's in the news, you know, as of late, can you explain? Explain the decision in Alabama and what you think the significance of that is in terms of the um, you know, re reproductive health system going forward and access to, the, to you know, reproductive health for women. Yeah. So really quick, um, the issue in Alabama was that um, someone's embryos were destroyed in a terrible accident um, where uh, that shouldn't have happened. Right. And so um, they took that to court. And basically the argument of the lawyers representing the couples that were affected um, said these were children. And so this is a crime as if children were murdered. Essentially, that's what he they were saying. Um, and, the, and it was initially thrown out, but then the Supreme Court ruled in favor and said, yeah, these, these are potential future children. So we're going to treat them like children, according to the law. Why is this a problem? Because I, as a fertility doctor, know that while IVF has become very successful, it often takes multiple embryos to get to that healthy outcome. And in order to get those healthy embryos, you have to create as many embryos as you possibly can because it's such a numbers game. And so people who don't know any better, especially people that have never been exposed to IVF and don't really know how it works, thinking that a fertilized egg is a person is a problem because then they start making rules that don't make sense. They start talking about, well, maybe, maybe fertility clinics should only be, you know, fertilizing one egg at a time. And maybe they shouldn't be allowed to keep all these extra embryos frozen, or maybe they shouldn't be allowed to discard embryos that we know are genetically abnormal and have no reproductive potential, which is ludicrous because then somewhat a poor patient who doesn't even have normal embryos is now forced to pay for, for them to be in storage indefinitely, right. it would just make IVF inaccessible and less successful. And so that's why the world was up in arms or the country was up in arms about this decision and the downstream potential consequences. And there's a lot of, especially red states where these conversations are happening and it's purely due to a lack of understanding. And I respect all viewpoints. There are some patients that come to me and have a moral dilemma in the way they view their embryos. And I respect that. But from what I know and how I understand IVF and what it takes to be successful, I just don't want lawmakers meddling in what I need to do for my patients to help build families. And so that's the high level issue. I don't think anyone should panic, but I think we all do need to pay attention uh, and, and there needs to be a collective effort to speak up and make sure that we're talking to our representatives. And Ashley, you're the better person to talk about political action and rallying people and making sure we're all educated and on the same page. Well, and I think right now what we're doing is very important, right? Talking about this because whenever you're having conversations with other people and they don't know what IVF is and they don't know exactly what an embryo is, this is what's going to make a difference. Like when you just hear these news clips and you're not educated on the issues, you could be swayed one way or the other, but these personal stories really make a difference. Um, right. And just like I'll share that uh, with my first embryo transfer, we had a highly graded embryo. Uh, there's, you know, no reason why it shouldn't have worked. Um, I was pregnant at first, but at the seven week mark, eight week mark, I had a miscarriage. And so it's not fair to say that these are children, right? These are mm -hmm. the possibility of children, but it's, it's not a child. Um, there's a yeah. lot that has to happen in between creating that embryo, implanting yeah. the embryo, you know, <laughs> And I, and I feel like people are entitled to their own beliefs, but it just, I don't think it's fair for that to be applied arbitrarily to something as important as the way we, how far we've progressed, you know, it's not perfect still, but we've come such a long way. If you look at IVF success rates in the seventies and eighties, when it first was invented, it was like less than 5%. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that that's the biggest issue is that lawmakers need to talk to doctors or they should just not be involved in these decisions at all. And on the point of education and awareness, do you think it's important for 
your OBGYNs to be talking about family planning options sooner as a part of your routine visits? Or, you know, do you think that there could be opportunities um, to have these conversations more frequently in a more casual setting and, and be part of normalizing it? I think that there are a lot of OBGYNs that are doing a great job, but I think there's too much variability. I don't think it's fair for someone's reproductive health um, to hang in the balance of whether they came across the right OBGYN that was, you know, forward thinking and it was top of mind for them. And so in a similar way that we've made a huge push towards oncologists taking a moment when they diagnose someone with cancer to talk to them about their fertility and say, hey, you know what, here's a two week window, go freeze your eggs before chemotherapy, because that might irreversibly affect your fertility. There used to be a time where that was really variable. And it was like some people never got that conversation. And now we've done a really good job of raising awareness. And that's like standard of care. Now everyone gets to have that conversation. I feel like now the standard of care needs to be with general OBGYNs. It needs to be part of the counseling, just like getting a pap smear or getting a mammogram. Mm -hmm. um, it can't be just like this elective side thing that, you know, if it comes up, it comes up because it's so time sensitive. It's really crucial information. And to your point at the top of the call, we have always, you know, had those conversations about how to prevent unwanted pregnancy our entire lives. And, you know, we're not flipping that conversation when, um, you know, it really matters from a timeline standpoint and from an age standpoint. Right. And I wish, yeah. um, Ashley, I don't know how you feel about this, but I wish that someone would have had this conversation with me, you know, at one of my appointments and just asked me, you know, how do I feel about family planning? Check in, just check in. Right. Yeah. Um, what does my personal relationship look like is, you know, am I even thinking about that? And the answer at that time, you know, may have been no still, but at least it would have gotten the conversation going. Um, and I may have been curious to know more. Um, so I'd love to hear what you think, Ashley, on that. No, I actually kind of received bad advice from my OBGYN at the time, because after I had my first miscarriage, she said, well, you know, you and Steve try for six months. And if nothing happens after six months, then, you know, then go see someone. That whole time I felt like something was wrong and I didn't do anything about it. And by the time I went in to see a fertility specialist, I had uterine polyps. So those six months that we were trying, that was just a complete waste. So if she, if she just would have checked in on me at one of those checkups, then I wouldn't have wasted six months, you know? And then right after that, the pandemic happened. So it was like, all of that was yeah, just yeah. wasted time. So if you feel like anything is going wrong and they're not taking you seriously, 100%, just skip all those steps. <laughs> yeah. I also will say um, it's shocking how many people will say like, I have really painful periods or my periods are really irregular and no one ever explained what that could be and tried to get a diagnosis. And trust me, as a doctor, I'm the last person to be doctor bashing, but I find that to be really unacceptable. I, I really do. And so I feel like, as Ashley said, if you feel something or see something, say something, right? Like you definitely owe it to yourself to be your own advocate and don't be afraid to get a second opinion, especially in a place like New York. There's so many OBGYNs and it is annoying to try to find a new one, but the best source is uh, word of mouth, right? If someone tells you that they love their OBGYN and had a great, a, a great experience with them, you can usually trust that type of a recommendation. And there are really good ones out there. And there's one thing I want to mention, and I actually meant to mention this like a, a while ago, um, but someone mentioned it about the, how much time just IVF or going through um, after you transplant or after <laughs> embryo transfer, yeah, yes. Yeah, after em embryo transfer. Um, I wish someone would have told me how much time that takes. And yeah. I know that it's not doable for a lot of people who have very demanding jobs. So I do think that's one important thing to check with, with the clinic that you're going to, to see if they can make it work either before work or after work. And that's one thing to definitely talk to your employer about, um, because someone said, mention 
how hard it is to be able to pay for these Mm -hmm. types of procedures. Um, A lot of employers now are offering benefits to do IVF. And if they're not, it's something you should be pushing them on. There are lots of scripts online that you can check uh, to petition your HRs to implement that into the company. Um, So I think those are important conversations to have with your clinic to make sure that you can make it work for yourself and then with your company to see if they would be able to put those benefits in contracts. Absolutely. I love that idea. And start asking about it, start asking about it at job interviews, because that will drive change. People will notice. Are there any other resources that people can check out in terms of financing um, this type of care? The clinic, right? You can call RMA of New York, where I work, and ask to speak to the finance department directly. They interface with patients directly all the time because it's so complicated and every plan is different that it's just better to speak to the experts. And you can do that even if you aren't our patient, you know, just to get information and to understand prior to even coming for a consultation, what your insurance will cover, what it won't cover. So that way you're coming in and you can focus on the medicine, which is more than enough, right? But a lot of times people are coming in and they're like worried about their insurance. They're worried about how much things are going to cost. And I feel like that really needs to be taken out of the conversation as much as possible so that we're doing the right thing for you as the patient and able to focus on the goal and, you know, the medical management. And I know cost is a huge, you know, issue and it's an, it's an access to care issue. And we're working on that. There's a lot of changes happening in our field, which are thankfully driving down the cost, but even the medications, which is not a cost within the clinic that's like external to this whole thing. Even that's expensive. So there's a lot of room for improvement, but thankfully a lot more insurances are covering. And like Ashley said, we're seeing this changing even more because people are pushing for it. It's the biggest growing benefit that companies are offering right now. So that's why I'm saying definitely push for it because that's something that's very competitive in terms of companies. Yeah. And there are some scholarship opportunities out there. I know um, they're hard to find and it's annoying to look for them, but I have a couple on my page that people have shared with me. Um, I think it's under the highlight IVF uh, money help, Um, but I'm always happy to help if anyone ever wants to DM me about it. And our finance department does, um, you know, tell people about payment plans and grants and things like that. And oftentimes, you know, I'll help with applications for things like that. So definitely ask your clinic and, you know, don't, don't just assume that whatever they tell you at face value, that's it. There are other resources. Great. And Ashley, because you brought up your partner, I would love to understand, you know, what that experience for your partner was like throughout your journey and Lucky, how you guide uh, the partner and the relationship through through this process. Tell us so, about Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's somewhere in this chat. Um, <laughs> he was a wonderful partner throughout it. Um, Lucky can tell you, like, Steve was always asking a million questions Um, I actually scheduled the earliest appointment I could come in every time so that Steve would be able to come with me (laughs) to the appointments. Um, and he was very supportive. Um, (laughs) I feel like he always took things a little bit more personally than me. Uh, anytime we had some sort of roadblock, I had just kind of adapted this, um, survival mentality almost. And, Steve would want to know like why things didn't work, what we could do better. Um, but he, he was very supportive. He, um, I mean, he's a wonderful dad now. So, <laughs> or I mean, I guess he's always been a wonderful dad because he's a great dad to CJ as well. But um, I think it's so important to go through this process together and be able to communicate well about the process and be open if you are frustrated about anything, be open if you feel like the other person isn't supporting you well. I know that a lot of my friends have actually gone through therapy while they're going through the process because they don't feel like they're being understood. So I think that's always a great option because 
it is really hard. This is one of the hardest things you're ever going to do. And I'm, I'm not saying that lightly. Um, I, I, I wish do, does RMA have therapy that they offer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we do. Say, yeah. 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 We have a mental health team. Um, and I also think that a lot of couples don't need to do their therapy together. I feel like doing it separately can be very helpful as well. Um, but I've seen the full spectrum. I think most often I see that it really makes people closer because they have this united front. Um, and it's like, you know, kind of tackling this challenge together. Um, some couples have very different styles in terms of how they deal with setbacks and stress. And some people don't communicate at all. And others are like, Hey, where are you? Like, I need someone to communicate with. So, um, that comes down to like relationship marriage 101, right? Like I think you need a solid foundation of communication. And if you don't, and you're going through this process and I wouldn't be surprised if it would kind of accentuate that problem. Um, and that's why I think getting professional help early on is always helpful. I, I feel like most people um, when I bring up therapy are like, yeah, okay. Like it just feels like another thing on top of all the other appointments. It's just very overwhelming, but I've never had a couple or an individual turn around and say like, that was a waste of time. It's right. always like, oh, that was shockingly helpful. Right. And it's never surprising to me as a, as the outsider looking in, but I think when you're in the thick of it, it's hard to have insight. And sometimes, it, sometimes it's hard to help yourself, but we have a clinical psychologist. We have a whole mental health team. It's something available to all of our patients. And I think that that's an essential part that should be part of the model of every fertility clinic, because everything that we're doing is so charged with emotion and there's yep. such a mental health component to all of it. Yep. And I think I really like that suggestion of going through it before baby comes, because then you're dealing with whatever the issue is head on while you have the space and time to kind of focus on yourselves and strengthen your bond and relationship. Because as we know, once baby comes, <laughs> you know, it's a whole other um, yeah. roller coaster. So um, I really like that suggestion. It should even that... be something you talk about before you get married. Like, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, absolutely. Like what, what are your thoughts on what happens if we do have trouble getting pregnant? Because mm -hmm sometimes you find out a little too late that the other person is not on the same page. Right. Like how committed yeah. are you to this? Right. Exactly. I think some partners also struggle because they feel a lot of guilt. They're like, I can't believe my partner has to do all these shots, do this procedure. And all I'm being asked to do is provide a sperm sample, which mm -hmm. is something I do recreationally <laughs> all the time, you know, not to be crass, but I hear a lot of, um, a lot of partners say that where they're just like, it feels terrible that like, I can't do more and contribute more. And I think that's why a lot of times they'll like want to help with the shots. And I think coming to appointments, people will often, um, you know, think like, oh, well, what is it? Like, it's just a regular appointment. It's just a follicle count. But I think showing up goes a long way. And even if someone says, no, you don't need to come. It's an inconvenient thing for you to do. I would show up. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, I think um, we have a few minutes left. I'm gonna pull some questions from the Q and A chat. Um, is there a correlation between IVF pregnancy and preeclampsia? So preeclampsia is a problem in pregnancy where near the end of the pregnancy, usually it's in the third trimester, very common. Um, the placenta has less blood flowing to it and it senses that. And so it releases factors that makes your blood pressure go up because it wants you to be able to send more blood flow to the placenta and to the baby. Um, so it's often a problem in the third trimester when the placenta just gets kind of tired and stops functioning as well. Um, there's a lot of correlations between underlying infertility and problems like preeclampsia. And I think it's because some causes of underlying infertility, especially when there's like a uterine factor involved, there's an inherent lack of blood flow. Yep. And also preeclampsia is more common in women over the age of 35. Preeclampsia is more common in women carrying twins. So there's all these like messy correlations that makes it hard to tease apart. But yes, um, you know, there is thought to be a slightly increased risk in preeclampsia 
in certain populations going through IVF, but I wouldn't say every patient who does IVF is going to have preeclampsia. Um, I think nowadays, because we're doing single embryo transfers and because the way we practice has changed so much, there's much lower rates of things like twins. Um, the overall rates of those types of complications are much lower. It's complicated. It's hard to answer in less than five minutes. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, do you have a dietitian on the team as well? How, how yeah. closely linked is lifestyle, um, to, you know, fertility or infertility? So lifestyle plays a huge role, but having said that age plays the biggest role. So people will come to me and say, I know I'm 42, but I do yoga. I do this. I do that. It's important to know that you shouldn't blame yourself. You could be the healthiest person and still have infertility. Infertility is a disease. The healthiest people in the world that have never smoked a day in their life get cancer, right? It's a similar concept. So what I don't like about the lifestyle piece is that it, it kind of insinuates blame or that you can control everything and you can't. Having said that, you know, anything that's good for your heart health is better for your fertility. Think about blood flow again, right? Like, so, so a Mediterranean style diet, not eating as much red meat, not smoking, trying to drink a lower amount of alcohol, like less than four drinks in a given week. These are the overall healthy behaviors that are better for fertility and better for your overall health. I tend to have that holistic approach. I think too much, there's too much micromanaging and control and people being on these crazy crash diets. I don't think anything in extreme is good for you. There's a lot of misinformation out there that I think a lot of people use to gain notoriety or sell supplements yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. and yeah. it really takes advantage of a lot of women um, during this process. One time I called Lucky sobbing because I went to um, get acupuncture and they gave me a like this huge packet of foods I should not eat and when I left I felt like I had caused my miscarriage because it was like a bunch of things that I had eaten at that time. Um, yeah, so I, I really do feel like it can be harmful to go down that path too much. What about caffeine or alcohol while trying to conceive? Someone's asking. So caffeine is okay in moderation. And so what that means is once you're pregnant, less than 200 to 300 milligrams a day, uh, an Americano, a tall Americano at Starbucks is like 150 milligrams of caffeine. So if you keep it to like one cup a day, you're fine. Um, and there's some data that, you know, really extreme levels, like four to five cups of coffee or more a day while you're pregnant, there could be a correlation with risk of miscarriage. And the idea is that caffeine vasoconstricts and again, blood flow. Um, so, you know, but it's not clear, but it's just out of an abundance of caution, we say less than one drink of caffeine per day. Um, alcohol, like I said, just keep it to less than four drinks per week. And that's based on many studies combined that have shown this overall pattern or correlation with improved fertility outcomes, whether you're trying on your own, unassisted or with um, the help of treatment. I think we are at time. I'm excited to announce our giveaway winner. Um, and that is Desiree Grubbs. Congratulations, Desiree. Thank you for joining. Thank you too so much for such an important conversation. I'm so sorry that I'm shrouded in darkness, but the sun set on me. <laughs> I didn't want to step away to turn the light. So, um, and you know, it really has been such an eye-opening and important conversation. So thank you so much for being so open, sharing your story, sharing your expertise. Um, I know I learned a lot and I hope that everyone here did as well. Thank you all for joining. Thanks for having us. I could talk for like two more hours. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you guys.